So as a result, collaboration was a struggle. Uh, there was trust issues starting to grow uh, among the team members because neither side was truly able to really work efficiently. And that's where my team and those in our design leadership had to take a step back and ask ourselves, how do we solve these trust issues and the confusion that we're having? excited to be here with you today. I'm kind of blown away that I get to talk about something that has become a major passion of mine. Uh, didn't start out this way. So today I'm going to be sharing with uh, kind of the story of how I got into this. And uh, let's go ahead and get that party started. Let me just make sure all my stuff is sharing the right way. All right, looking good. Perfect. All right. So my experience has been all kinds of interesting over the years. So I actually made the full-time move into design operations in a full-time role about two years ago. Before that, I was a design lead here at T. Rowe Price for about five years before that, and then a UX designer as an individual contributor um, at various companies before. So my path into design operations wasn't through a program management channel, but much more through the UX design and design space. Um, but during my time in design leadership, I was already executing on a number of design operations, just ideas and methodologies. And through that, I came to learn more about design operations. And what I found is that this truly is my passion. And it was a major reason that I decided to go ahead and pursue this as a full-time role, because how often do we get to literally work in our passion? So it's been pretty amazing. So my path hasn't necessarily been a difficult road. Um, it just took a while to get it going. Um, but I've been super lucky to work with so many open-minded design leaders over the years, some of them who I just saw in the chat. Um, but this has definitely been a path that I've had to pay for myself. And we'll be talking more about that in just a few minutes. Um, so a few personal things about me, because I always like to overshare. I am a avid bullet journaler, as Nico shared. I, I love kind of the analog planning and productivity. It's been super helpful for me over the years. I love a good fountain pen. It kind of comes with the territory. Um, and I recently took up disc golfing, which I found is actually super fun. You get to be competitive and be outside and go hiking. And you can't really uh, say anything bad about that at all. So I like it. I'll do a real quick overview of my organization and my group specifically. So uh, for almost about 90 years now, T. Rowe Price has been helping people close the gap between what they have and then what they'll need so that they can live confidently. And more specifically, a lot of the times that's in retirement. I specifically work with the retirement plan services business. I'm going to call it RPS throughout this presentation because it's much easier to do, uh, where my team builds the experiences for our employee-sponsored retirement programs. Uh, T. Rowe Price has about 7,000 global employees, 52 countries in which we're serving our clients and our shareholders. We have over 100 designers as a part of our design community at T. Rowe Price, and I work with an amazing team of 13 product design team members, that's including myself, as well as cross-functional teams with product managers, our dev teams, researchers, our marketers, and a whole bunch of other people too, which I'll introduce you to in our org chart. Um, design operations didn't actually exist here at T. Rowe Price when I joined. I think a lot of people come across that in their different businesses as well. But there were several clear signs and symptoms that catalyzed the need for design operations. Something that I like to do anytime I meet anyone new in design operations is I like to ask them, what was your design ops catalyst? So if you want, you can drop this in the chat. What was it that got you into design operations or interested in design operations? For me, mine was actually coming to T. Rowe Price in 2015. I don't mean any shade by this comment whatsoever, but the UX team that I was joining was relatively new and there was a lot of opportunity. So when I joined, there was poor to no onboarding process. Um, I found out a lot about stuff just on my own, just from asking a lot of questions. There was multiple processes that was in, that were in place for like how work was actually getting done. There was no real capacity management at the time. Everything was yes, work just kind of flowed in. There was no conversation about really like planning for that type of work. Um, and work was extremely siloed. I used to kind of half joke to say, well, this team is kind of like being on a, like an individualized sport. There wasn't a whole lot of team activity going on early on. And there was also no centralized design tools for UX. Everybody was using what they liked. 
Um, my first year, I took a lot of opportunity. I took a lot of that like individualized like starting and I decided to work with some of my like minded team members. So in that first year of being on that team um, with a few others, like I mentioned, we documented and established our UX design process. It was something that was never kind of truly written. It was kind of there, but we just kind of brought everything together so that we could share that and also follow along with it ourselves. Um, we established just file organization for our UX team. It seems so simple, but when that doesn't exist or it's not working effectively, it's something that you can spend time on and should spend time on. Um, we also researched and procured UX pin uh, for UX pin prototyping at the time. Um, it was a fun project, like a research project we got to do. And then I got to bring on my very first tool, which was a learning process. Uh, and then also began doing some light capacity tracking for our UX team uh, early on with that. So as I started doing this work early, early on, I didn't know that it actually had a name. Uh, 2017, I came across probably the most influential article I've ever read uh, on Medium. It's by one of my favorite guys, Dave Maloof. I call him the grandfather of design ops. You probably wouldn't like that. Uh, but he was the person who taught me so much about this. And he had this article, it was called, What is Design Operations and Why Should You Care? And like I mentioned, I attribute a lot of my design ops knowledge to Dave and his writing on this topic. This article was a game changer for me professionally and personally as well. And honestly, this is what started me on my path to a full-time design ops career. Uh, then in 2017, in November, I attended the Design Ops Summit. This is a summit that currently exists, actually happening next week, and I'm sad I'm not going to be able to go. But this is a summit that is dedicated to design operations and the community. And it was here that I met my tribe. I met these like-minded people at different sized companies. I was meeting people from Google and Pinterest and Zendesk, and they were talking about these giant design arts organizations that they had. And then I was also meeting people like myself who were just learning about what design operations was and how it had impacts on their companies and their teams and what they were doing. And I came back from that conference with so much energy. It was kind of ridiculous. And anyone that worked with me at the time knew it. I was literally posting up sketch notes from the talks on every wall that I could find. I was talking about it nonstop. I just knew that like this was it for me. Like this is where I wanted to go. This is what I wanted to do. And I wanted to make it happen at T. Rowe Price. Um, it doesn't necessarily always happen that way. Um, and something that I kind of found by accident while I was doing this, I'm the thumbnail, a very unflattering thumbnail of me uh, from that summit uh, that I found on YouTube. Um, but it really was just amazing just to be a part of that community and kind of talk about that. Let's get rid of that terrible picture. Uh, then in 2018, I went to my second ops conference and this is where I started to really double down on design operations. I was talking about it. I started infusing in everything that I was doing, even though there was not a full-time role and no one else was really talking about it at the time. I found some like-minded people at work, which really helped out. But it took four years for me from this standpoint of like learning what design operations even was, and then coming to a point now where I was actually able to finally secure a full-time role at T. Rowe Price in this RPS organization with an absolutely amazing team and an incredible design leader who recognized the need for it on her team and who honestly has been just a true champion both for myself and design operations. So like I said, it hasn't been a hard road. I've been truly lucky with a number of leaders that I've worked with over the years. So yay. So at the highest level, if you're unfamiliar with design operations, design operations, is really working on building strong and impactful design teams by organizing and orchestrating people, process, and tools. It's kind of the definition you hear. Uh, Meredith Black, uh, who's highly involved and kind of started up the Design Ops Assembly, recently said Design Ops is everything but design, and she couldn't be more true. It has so many pockets to it. Um, as Design Ops started to develop into kind of an official function, I'll call it at T. Rowe Price, specifically in our design community, I worked with other people to really help define our goals and our operation principles on how we wanted this to look. So again, not necessarily in a full-time role, but already starting to talk about and implement it. And we knew that we wanted to focus on kind of forming things going into this. 
Uh, the first is just auditing your resources. It's just scoping out your projects, making sure that your projects are staffed and resourced appropriately. We know that we needed to work on improving our workflow efficiency. How are we measuring things? How can we improve efficiency and how can we save time in what we're doing to allow our designers and our content strategists and our other team members to do truly what they are here to do. Um, we also really focused on process and collaboration. That's a sticking point for so many different businesses and companies, but our goal is to build strong cross-functional relationships. We want to be able to talk about our process and our product, and we want to also be able to kind of share that across the board with our engineering teams and our marketing teams and just anyone who we work with. It just makes so much sense. The other part is just implementing the right tool stack. I think every business is in it. You never kind of stop worrying about tools, but we want to make sure that we're evaluating the right tools for our teams. We're onboarding them appropriately. We're making them available and then managing those to make sure that our design teams can get done what they're here to actually do. So as I mentioned, it's important to just acknowledge every company has a different approach to design operations. And there's many versions of different op models that exist out there. Uh, this op maturity model is one of my favorites. This is by Rachel Posman and John Calhoun. Um, the main idea here is that every team needs different things. And sometimes you need different things at different times. A little bit of a word jumble there. But the idea, especially with this model, is that the key path to follow is that the progression happens as your design teams grow. So for example, with a smaller design team, you might only need one design ops team member on your team. That's how our team is right now. I'm a design team of one. Um, Dave Maloof actually used to share uh, the magic number for him, and it may have changed over time, used to be after you have nine design team members, that's the right time to start implementing and have in someone in design operations join your team. But as your team grows, you might add an additional person right, to help focus on certain programming or communication on certain areas. But again, you have to go through these different phases. And, and, and truly and honestly, as your team comes across these challenges, as your team is growing, expanding, each of these thresholds holds kind of good and bad, right? You get to a point where you go from a family of you know one to 30, which is still a big family, to an organization of over 200. You come across different challenges, and design ops can help focus in those areas, again, growing at scale. So in my time in design operations, I've learned that teams will need to lean into different aspects of design operations depending on your maturity level and also just your individual needs. Kind of like I said, Meredith Black says, design ops is everything but design, and that covers a lot of things. For me here at T. Rowe Price, that focus has been primarily in meetings and communication, program management, and tooling. For meetings and communication, um, this is really promoting just healthy collaboration between everyone involved in design and product. So this is focusing on your design team. This is focusing with your developers. This is focusing with your program managers. It's really everyone. And as a design operator, this can come in a multitude of different forms. You could be the meeting organizer. You might be the facilitator. And in many cases, design ops, we're also the hype people. We're getting you excited to be in these meetings. We want to make it fun. We want to do good work. So as an example, I run my Monday team meetings. I'm facilitating that meeting. I'm bringing in the icebreakers and the meeting starters. And we're focusing on tracking capacity. We're talking about the work that we're doing. That way, everyone's on the same page as we kick off our week. When it comes to program management, this is really for forecasting your work. This is helping to define what it is. It's supporting your systems and your processes that you work to put in place to make sure that your teams can work more efficiently. Uh, for my team, that comes in the form of our involvement with things like integrated planning, discovery and research work, as well as just cross squad organization and prioritization one of my favorite words in design operations and not in other people's. Um, and then there's also tooling. I love this area. I know not everyone necessarily does. I love finding new tools that are helping our teams do better work. And so if you're in design operations and for us here at T. Rowe Price, this has been really important just to help the day-to-day -day operation experience for our teams and make it work and elevate the designers and their work that they're doing. 
So as a design operator, again, this can take the form as a tool administrator, kind of getting people in there and kind of orchestrating and auditing and doing all that fun stuff no one else wants to do. Uh, that could also be training and that could be working with procurement to bring it in, legal and all the other fun people that are a part of that process. So it, it really takes on multiple levels. And your team structure is certainly, and I'll say your team structure as well as your maturity, kind of those two things go together and that's really what's going to help you determine where you and your organization might need to focus. So if you're a smaller team, you might actually just be focused on just putting simple processes into place. You're not necessarily trying to take on this mountain right out of the door, right? Um, once your team starts to grow and scale, you start working with more cross-functional teams and collaborating when the number of meetings you have starts to overtake kind of your day to day, and you see those silos starting to form it's at that point that you need to then take a step back and start to reconsider where you need to focus and what's most important. And that's especially uh, certain what happened in our experience. So I'm gonna move on to design ops at T. Rowe Price. Um, as you can imagine, and as I showed, T. Rowe Price is not a small company by any means with 7,000 people across the globe working together. Um, but the org structure, even within retirement plan services and RPS, the team that I'm working with, is quite complex. So just to share a little bit about what the people I work with on a day to day. So as I mentioned, I work with 12 amazing product design team members, 13, including myself, that includes our design capability lead, that great person I talked about before that gave me my full time role. Uh, we have two design leads, we have a content design lead, as well as myself as a design operations lead. We have one dedicated researcher, four UX designers and three content strategists. We then work with 13 different B2C product teams. We have seven B2B product teams that we're also working with. We have two product marketing teams and a sales team that we also help support. So that's over 20 different teams that we can be working with at any certain time throughout the year. And things start to pop up when you start to do that. More team members, more sub teams. So these would start to kind of veer their ugly heads. You have the potential for more silization, right? Siloed teams doing what they want to do in their own spot, which creates less visibility. It creates overall like difficulty just on your process and what's happening. And you're starting to develop a little bit more distance between your design and your development teams. This is something that our team had struggled with early on, but this is an area that we've decided that we want to focus on and we keep it in check. And honestly, I feel like our team has done a fantastic job in really kind of honing this in. But an area that we see over time that this can also cause problems with are those cross collaborative teams. And specifically for us, an area that we really had to come and face was our designer and our developer collaboration. As a product team, this is how we get our job done. So the collaboration between design and dev is a really good example of one of those change or those challenges that every product organization grapples with over time. It's definitely a catalyst for design ops at a lot of different organizations and is a really big one for us. So before we had what we have now, most of our design teams were working collaboratively in Figma and in a product file all together. And in, and in a lot of teams, especially smaller teams, this makes a lot of sense. You don't have the budget or maybe the need necessarily to go broader than that. But um, like most teams, what we found is that when you're working in those same files, a lot of things start to cause problems over time. And you'd think we're all in the same file. This is easy collaboration. It's perfect. It just wasn't the case for us. So what happened was that by bringing everyone into the same file, designers, product owners, developers, we were actually running into some pretty major problems. Uh, the first thing is that each designer early on had their own way of setting up their own files. So at a small scale, this isn't a major problem, but when you start to multiply that across a large organization or over 20 different product teams that you might be working with, that made collaboration really difficult. So many of our designers are early on, were kind of doing their own thing. There was no real standardization for design organization and documentation. And yet that's exactly what our developers and our broader organizations, that's what they needed at scale. So the immediate impact of having everyone in the same file right off the top was 
clarity. So here's an example. Uh, we have our working file in Figma, and we used to, back in the day, draw a line and put our next iteration right below it. We would redline in Figma uh, to help out our developers. We would also sometimes export our files uh, into a PDF and redline and give direction and kind of make notes around accessibility there. And then we would send that off to them. And what was happening is our developers were getting very confused inside of that design file. Um, designers were constantly trying to kind of satisfy everyone within a single design space. So as a result, collaboration was a struggle. Uh, there is trust issues starting to grow uh, among the team members because neither side was truly able to really work efficiently. And that's where my team and those in our design leadership had to take a step back and ask ourselves, how do we solve these trust issues and the confusion that we're having? And this is exactly where the communication and, and kind of the process of how we work, where are those breakdowns? How can we identify those? And then how can we fix them? That's a really important part. So to solve the problem, you first have to get an understanding of it. I often uh, relate design operations to my UX background, uh, where you're in UX, your customer is your user. But in design operations, your customer is your design team now. And we have to solve those same problems. So what we did together is we just looked closely at how our designers and our developers were regularly interacting during the product development cycle. And in doing so, we were able to identify a few parts of that design to dev workflow that were causing a lot of inefficiency. So for example, when a design was ready for development, designers were telling the developers either word of mouth or by email with a Figma link and saying, hey, file's ready for you, go. Uh, seems pretty simple, but the problem is, is that sometimes design needs to make small updates or tweaks to those designs. And the developers were just assuming that things were ready. Now that's gonna go ahead and lead to problems down the line. Rework, time's gonna be wasted, and that mistrust. People fooling around in files they shouldn't be as the team is trying to work to make new updates. Um, another example of this is when new iterations came in. As I mentioned, we were kind of stacking our iterations on top of each other. That creates unclear just direction for the developers. Well, what has changed? How do I know that it has? How do I navigate this humongous file? Like, how do I know where I need to go as a developer? And also, if I'm brand new to your project as a developer, I have no context as to what in the world is happening in this single file. And then finally, um, something that we actually came up and was important, I'll talk about this in just a bit, is that our developers are having a really hard time understanding the flows and the interactions that we were creating in our designs. And the worst thing you can have maybe not the worst thing, but something that's not great in your product development is having a developer infer how a product should be designed or should be worked based off of a design with no documentation or clarity. So on my team and maybe yours too, time is our currency. So any inefficiencies in a process is costing us. So what we do is we use the data that we have, we can usually follow some of those trends and just clearly see where our teams are spending that time within a product. So a lot of these things that are costing us with kind of a negative workflow is redoing work, right? If I have to redesign something or a developer has to redev it, that is time taken away from us doing the best work that we can do and moving forward. It's also building low confidence with your teams, both designers and developers, that extra time it's taking to develop because you're looking at PDFs and red lines and trying to figure out what goes where. Uh, you start to find design discrepancies as you go through in the QC process. When you're like, I gave you everything in this one file, why didn't you just follow what was here? And they're like, yeah, but you have seven things in here. I don't know what I have to do. And then overall, that just starts to create really bad cross-functional relationships. And that's never a good thing. So if your team is running to similar inefficiencies like we did, uh, first take it from me, you are not going to be able to figure out everything at once. You have to take it on in pieces and prioritize what's most important. But I do have some steps here that you can follow that we did to help sign and kind of solve your design to dev inefficiencies a lot faster. So the first is just to take an inventory of how your team works, uh, particularly around your workflow and tooling. What is working? and what is not working. So to understand this, you have to understand your team's current tool stack and those workflows. Uh, similar to in UX, how we'll create a user flow, right? Or, or a mind map or a user map of, of what an experience looks like. Do that same exact thing, but do it for your team, right? Build that out from start to finish of what that experience looks like. Then once you have that, 
you can conduct listening tours. And all that is is just going around and just talking to people on your design teams and your leadership teams and your dev teams. The thing that most people don't usually think about is that those individual conversations with those people is so invaluable. These are the people who are doing the work every single day. They know what they like, they know what they don't like, and most of the time with a listening ear and someone asking them, they will spill everything. And that is that is gold to design operations. Um, there's also a good thing I like to do often, which is just even talking to your design leadership or your overall business leadership, because you might actually find that there are some limitations that are not usually immediately apparent when you're working with teams. There might be, um, I don't like to use the word politics, but politics and things. Maybe there's a reason things aren't kind of in place the way that they are. Uh, just understanding asking those questions is super helpful. So uh, for our team, going through these steps is what helped us uncover a lot of these inefficiencies. Um, as we went over in those previous slides, it really kind of helped us get through that. So I want to share with you now the exciting part about how we did that. Um, this was a big area of change for us. We went from kind of this inefficient single file piece to now changing over to using Zeppelin and our Zeppelin workflow, which I want to share with you right now because it was incredibly helpful and continues to be. So by using Zeppelin as a separate space for our finalized designs, uh, we were actually able to avoid that confusion that was happening before um, and really give dev everything they needed in a very organized and a systematic way. And with Zeppelin, we were able to do this first by keeping that inherent messiness that we like to do in our design exploration completely away from our development teams. There was no anyone fooling around or surfing around in files to see what was going on because what they needed is right here. We also get a nice orderly way to update and iterate on those new versions and designs. So instead of um, expecting a developer to know how my design file functions, we put it in one place, it's clearly marked, it's updated, and they can get exactly what they want. So you know, even though there are multiple ways to mark things ready for dev and Figma, don't get me wrong, this is not trashing on Figma at all. Having Zeppelin for us, though, was really central to us in that design to dev collaboration and just making that whole process less error prone, less time consuming across our entire product teams. It's not at 100%, but we've seen ginormous improvements in, in how we've done that. There's also some additional collaboration challenges that uh, Zeppelin Workflow actually uh, both created, but then also solved for us at the same time. So before our developers were getting confused on what the screen flow was, if you've ever worked in Zeppelin, sometimes it just looks like a, a sea of pages. Uh, and they were having a really hard time kind of following the path that they needed to. Uh, there's also early breakdowns too with having to cross-reference PDF files or anything else around kind of design direction and accessibility. Um, so unifying our designers and our developers in, in Zeppelin has actually really helped with that because there's a lot of features of Zeppelin that have helped us kind of move that conversation and that collaboration forward. Um, and a big part of that is how Zeppelin keeps the documentation structured in context. So just for example here, um, one of the features that has made a really big difference for us in design and collaboration with our developers is called Flows. Uh, it's a really nice unified way to kind of document the complete user flow in Zeppelin, which are sometimes difficult to do in other tools, especially at scale. So for example, in those earlier versions of Figma, there's a lot of manual work, a lot of arrows and notes and kind of things kind of put all over the place just to try to communicate what was happening. But now with Zeppelin, we can easily just connect those pages visually. That for a developer is a quick communication. This is what happens, this is where it goes, and they can easily understand the intent and direction of what we're trying to communicate in our designs. Um, we've also gone from having multiple meetings a week to try to uh, verbally communicate a lot of these pieces that were problems before to, I would say all, not none, but like a lot less than it was before, right? This is time that your designers are spending in more meetings to try to communicate something that should be a lot easier. And again, we talked about time as our currency. That's another takeaway from our designers moving on to the next thing or being able to spend more time in an area that they're excited about. No one wants to sit in a meeting just to communicate something if you can have a tool that can do it for you. One of our other most used features in Zeppelin has been annotation. So um, we talked about kind of placing things all over the place. What I like about Zeppelin and what our design team likes about it is you can create these points in time directly on your design and you can communicate 
whatever you need. Are those requirements? Uh, are those behaviors? Are those accessibility requirements? It's very clear. Uh, with Figma, again, we had a lot of cross-referencing that was going on. PDFs, red lines, Figma files, all of that. And our design team was first spending time creating PDFs, which most designers, no one likes to create a PDF, especially a designer, then redline that, then send that, then also make sure that the team has the most recent file, right? This is all, again, time taking away from our designers doing what they're truly here to do, which is design. And same thing for our content strategists as well. They're spending so much time making sure everything's right in these PDFs and everywhere, they could be working and spending their time on better things. And so Zeppelin for us, again, has been that. It's given everyone kind of what they need when they need it. And again, we're listening to our developers share feedback. We thought everything was great. Well, the developers are having a hard time kind of tracking through things so we can implement a feature that has made things a lot better. So as you can see, Zeppelin has actually been super helpful for us. Again, finding the right tool for your team when they need it is just crucial. Um, and it's been really great with opening up just better communication channels through our workflow. But there are other design operation considerations that I want you to also think about too, especially if you're in a spot where you are a design operator and working inside of a product space like this, or even if you're not, but you're kind of the person who gets to do this a lot or wants to stand this up and make it happen. Remember that as a design operator, part of your job, your responsibility is allowing your team the time that they need to do what's most important for them. And that's their craft. So you have to always think about what can I do to give everyone else more time to do what they're actually here to do. So the first thing I like to always do or think about uh, or implement is introducing new tools to teams. I love it. It's so fun to do, but this can be super time consuming, uh, especially if you're onboarding a new developer. So something that our team has done is just recording our tool demos when we are introducing a tool to a new team. By recording that, we can then take that and then share that or put that in a centralized place that all of our development teams can come to. So when they onboard a new developer, they can go ahead and say, hey, here's the, the tool demo for Zeppelin. This is the tool that our teams use please watch through this. And that way, when they start with their teams, they're already a step ahead. They don't have to worry about us training them again to do that. Also, the more time that you can create for your teams, the better, right? Trust, communication, norms, all of those things happen over time. But just don't forget that your teams also need time outside of your standups and your, your project meetings to do that. So if you can create more opportunities for that interaction, whether it's virtual or in person, make sure you're also thinking about that. And one of my favorite parts of this process uh, is just getting that feedback from the team as well. It's super important. Um, doing that can take form in a lot of different ways. Um, I look at it as just an overall, just nurturing a relationship. Um, so you can do this through something like a retro type style where you're just asking people, hey, we implemented this new tool or this new process. Give me some feedback. What's working? What's not? What should we change for next time? Or something I love to do is just an asynchronous survey out to your teams and asking them about what worked and what didn't, and then how might you be able to improve that in the future. I do want to say I am not single-handedly taking on design operations and the responsibilities for every design team across our organization. I have the great honor of working and collaborating with other design leaders at T. Rowe Price. Each person brings a different background and a knowledge and experience. And even though they may not be in it for the design operator role or they don't really like that part of the job, they do have experience. And if you find people in your organization, maybe that is you that really enjoys that part of the process, listen, step up and use those things, right? This is going to help you across the board and across your teams, just build stronger communication and overall a stronger design community. So over the years, together as an active participant community that we created, we've actually been able to do a lot. And this is before, again, before design operations ever existed here, uh, you know, together as teams, we actually developed a full active community on a very large scale with a lot of decentralized teams. Um, we created a design system that started as a part of our design community and actually built out into its whole separate team now. Uh, communication across our decentralized teams has also increased as well. It keeps everyone informed on what's happening. 
We've also liked to share and collaborate our best practices. Um, I mentioned onboarding in the very beginning of this. It's still a passion area of mine. I don't want anyone to go through a similar experience. I want them to have everything they need. And we've been sharing a lot across our teams, working towards kind of a singular way to bring new designers and content strategists and other people into our teams. And we've also come to a pretty good agreement on design tools. It's a really hard thing to do. Not everyone loves it, but it's something that's super beneficial. And that way, any team can work on anything at any time. So I want to thank you so much for listening to the presentation and really thinking and kind of going through our process on how we've identified problems and then we work towards solving those and hopefully how design operations can continue to evolve your teams or maybe get something stood up in your organization if one doesn't exist. Uh, really looking forward to the Q&A. And then, of course, if you ever want to connect, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. And Nico did a great job of sharing all the other links, too. So I really appreciate it. That was great, Mark. Uh, really appreciate it. Great presentation. Um, yeah, let's hop into some Q&A. We've got a lot of great questions in the chat. Before we get there, um, I do want to touch a little more on kind of like that designer to developer collaboration that you mentioned. Obviously, that's very near and dear to Zeppelin's heart as well. Um, it's part of the reason, you know, we speak to design ops leaders like you. Um, we kind of see ourselves as like part of that design ops tool stack. And I'm yeah. glad you feel the same way. <laughs> so you had mentioned, you know, the mistrust um, that formed between designers and developers um, and how you address that with, you know, different processes, um, tools as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind of curious, you know, if you have like identified or if you can speak more on like the causes of that, was that like part of like an organizational structure thing or like what, what were some of the, the root causes of that uh, mistrust that formed? Yeah, I think the biggest thing really came from feedback from our design team uh, and listening to what was happening inside of their spaces. Um, I, I kind of mentioned it briefly, but no one likes anyone fiddling with your designs or looking mm -hmm. through things or kind of going into that. Um, so a really big part for us was just, you know, I want to kind of create this space that where we can work, have a work in progress and then be able to kind of just share what we want with others. Right. Um, when, a, when a design team goes through a lot of, like we talked about rework, uh, miscommunication, spending hours, days inside of QC because things just weren't done the way that they were designed because of that confusion, like that creates so much stress for your team. So mm -hmm. for us, it was really listening to our designers first because they are the ones doing this every single day. And right. if you don't have happy designers, you do not have a happy organization. So it was just listening to that and getting things into order, right? It's really important. I'm here for their health and mental wellness and their day to day. So I have to make sure that I'm doing things to make that better. And then that kind of grows exponentially then making better experiences for our developers too. So it really starts with your team and listening and understanding and then working towards a common goal. I'm not just trying to solve for them. I do want to, but I do want to create kind of a, a larger uh, kind of echoing effect of creating just a good process altogether. Right. No, that, that makes sense. Um, and it, it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned like you don't want necessarily like from the designer's perspective, like all these developers in their design file. You know, we had um, Jennifer's a designer in the chat, actually, and she said, you know, she's like a team of one with like a ton of developers. And that's kind of why you kind of want that separation of like design and ready to build. Right. Like you don't want yeah. every developer in on your file while you're trying to work. You know, every designer works differently, so they should all be able to stay uh, in Figma. And then when they're ready to go, you know, here's whatever's in Zeppelin is is ready to build. You can't touch it. You can't mess with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like that separation, I think, is super important. Um, and so you also mentioned, you know, you know, like this is not just about designers, even though like as design ops, designers come first for you. Um, but it's also about developers, because at the end of the day, you need both to be happy to build your product. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So kind of, I guess what I'm getting at now is even though you're within design ops and you're focused on designers, uh, how much like insight, I guess, do you have um, into like what you're doing affects the developer side, like from their point of view, that collaboration, like, do you get feedback from them? Like, how do you kind of manage that? Like, I guess, seeing the other side, so to speak. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, when I started learning about design operations, DevOps has been around for much longer and I feel like it's much more known inside of the community and it, a lot of the same type of processes and thing in place for developers. From my side, you know, I thought way back in the day I wanted to be a front end developer and I was like, I don't know, this is really for me. But like understanding kind of that process and how it goes, right? Uh, we talk about in UX, right? Empathizing with your customer. 
Mm -hmm. You have to do that with your developers too. These right. are people, they have feelings, they want to do the best job that they can possibly do the same way the design team does. And there isn't always a lot of that cross collaboration and conversations. A lot of the times, and both my experiences even today, uh, product owners and other people try to keep designers and developers very separate because developers have their story points that they're building and their time and designers are like, we want to talk to you. And it's like, nope, what do you what do you want? I'll tell them. And it just puts up those those silos, right? Those mm -hmm. walls between these teams when really the best efficient way that you can do this is having the person designing, talking to the person developing and sharing that. And so when you don't always get that, you have to find those workarounds sometimes. Again, I don't, I, I, I kind of survey, I listen, I'm, I'm hearing, seeing the problems that are happening here. So I'm not directly always like in their, in their mask, not mask, but you know, in their stuff, like talking to them every day, what's going on. People be like, get the hell out of here, Mark. Like right. you're bothering me. But just listening and understanding and just again, mm -hmm. empathizing with that. What can I do to help you out more? Mm -hmm. Again, I talked about flows just as an example. That came out of our design, our developers don't know what the next screen or like what's the next experience because everything's on here. Okay, great. Came back to the team. What might we be able to do to help this out? Oh, it just happened to work out great that Flows was introduced as a, as a feature. We're like, well, let's try this. We tried it. We brought some developers in and asked them, hey, does this work? And they were like, boom, that's exactly what I needed. So now the designers just connect the screens and that's all they needed. So again, it's not always being in their stuff and always being like right there, but just listening um, to everyone in these meetings and kind of pick up on those little notes and then being able to go in deeper and ask those questions at a later time. For sure, for sure. And I think, you know, you hit it right on the head. Like it's that common goal uh, at the end of the day, like, and then I, I love how you, you know, compared like empathizing to your customer versus, you know, like before you get to the customer, you need to build it, right? And so yeah. you empathize with the other stakeholders on your team. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we can pivot to um, some questions from the audience. Um, this is a question that I, you know, I think you would have. Uh, uh, I, we've we've spoken about this at length before. Um, how any tips for early stage design teams planting the seed for design ops from the ground up? I know you have a, you know, a rich history of of getting that um, that buy in. Yeah. So uh, so here's the best thing. This might not necessarily. Um, work out for everyone you have to do this eloquently you have to talk about it you have to let people know about it but more importantly you have to show how this could create change and be beneficial for your teams again i did that for four years before finally someone was like i need this help and luckily i was working on a totally different team where my boss at the time knew how passionately I wanted to have design operations on our team, but someone else had an opportunity and they were like, I don't want to do this, but Mark is the guy. Mark is the design ops guy you want to talk to. And that opened up opportunities. But that was after years of literally wallpapering, wallpapering walls with sketch notes from meetings, uh, talking about how we could do it, but then also implementing that and then showing design leadership and others that this can make a difference. The problem that a lot of people see with this, and I'm a different type of person, this is extra work that you have to do on top of your day to day. Um, one thing I did early on, and again, not every people can do this, but a previous manager, I said, hey, can I have one day where I can focus on design operation things? Uh, he was like, sure. I, I showed him that it was important. And then I implemented those things. And I was dedicated to that one day to doing everything operationally that I needed to. So that, you know, the other four days of the week, I was a UX designer. Um, so there's little things like that, that you can kind of build in, but really, honestly, planting the seed involves you talking about it until people are sick of hearing you talk about it until they are like, you are the design ops person. I know that I know that you want this here. It's just maybe it's not the right time, the right leadership. But I've also seen what you've done and why this is important, and how this could change. And I think a really important note, too, is most people will say to you, OK, well, Mark, once you implement that change and that process, like, what do we need you for anymore? Not that anyone was exactly saying that, but that's usually what people hear. And the thing is, is that job never ends. There will be a reorg. There will be new teams. We will get more work. Hey, by including these things, I can make 20 percent more availability for our design team. Well, people love that you can take on more work. 
in balance, but use those numbers, use what metrics you have just to show that. And you also have to kind of talk like the business. That was a, a talk at one of the early design op summits was that to be in design operations and to work and to influence at the business level, you have to speak as the business speaks. So you have to talk metrics and numbers and things that maybe you don't feel comfortable with um, to kind of get the message through and to show that it actually is important. Definitely. And I feel like that's, you know, kind of uh, along like the same lines as this other question we had here um, from Ariel, um, which kind of, you know, I guess is more specific towards like a <clears throat> traditionally dev led organization, but kind of still the same thing by getting that um, empowerment for design ops um, with leadership. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is one that I think everybody wants. Uh, and and when you get it, I think the best advice is that once you have a seat at that table, own that seat, make sure that you are a part of those conversations, right? If you've been fighting to get onto that table and have a seat, make sure that you are saying and asking and being a part of the conversation and not just kind of sitting in the shadow. Um, I would say that especially in that space, you may have to do a little bit more time specifically in a dev led organization. You might have to spend more time understanding what that dev process looks like. And like I talked about empathizing and getting to know your now new user or your new customer or however you want to uh, talk about them, because there are going to be conversations that come up and you don't know how to develop, but you should know enough to be a little bit scary that when Ariel says, you know, X, Y, or Z about this, everyone goes, oh, Ariel knows what's up now. We got to be on top of our stuff. Uh, that's what you want, right? You want to be able to be a part of that conversation and do that. Um, it's a really big thing. It's big uh, opportunity. So make sure you take advantage of it because that doesn't always work. And the last thing you want is someone to take your chair away. For sure. For sure. I do. I'm, we're going to wrap up with a few more design ops questions, but I just saw I'm this. I'm going to go faster. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. You're good. You're totally good. But this one question caught my eye, um, a little spicy, but I like. I, just, I, had, I had to call this out. Did engineering complain that you brought in Zeppelin since it was another tool they had to learn? Oh, that's a good thing, Anonymous. Um, I don't know if you're on the dev team or not, but I would say, you know, I think for the most part, no. I think once the team uh, got, we, we trained them up on how it was going to work. We talked to them about how it was going to make their day to day better, how we were going to be able to communicate more effectively and efficiently. They were all about it. Um, anything that can make their job easier, they're going to love. So no one complained about it. Um, again, the feedback we got was better, right? Because they said, okay, well, now we're using this, but this is a problem. And then we can go in and try to fix that. But for the most part, um, they really liked it and continue to like it. And we, you know, we took our seats from like 15 or 30 to a lot more now because every developer is like, wait, I can get in here. I can see the code. You can annotate this. Like I can, I can easily understand what you're trying to do. Sign me up. For sure. That's, you know, huge relief to hear you say that. Um, you know, I'm sweating <laughs> a little bit there, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of <laughs> our whole thing is being that like separate platform. So I think like, you know, even I think at the last last config conference, um, the Figma CTO said like, hey, Figma is not, you know, optimized for developers. It's a design tool. And that's kind of like why, you know, we think like there is that separation needed between like, you know, those ready to build designs and the ones that are still being worked on. Yeah. And just okay. as an example, because I know a lot of people talk about, I mean, dev mode is a real thing. It's out there. It's not a mm -hmm. secret. Um, that's one of those things where, again, if you have other things in place, the way that you can make developers mad is to just jump ship on a product just because it's the new hot thing. Actually take that back and start to understand. And, and again, put that against your current workflow and process. These are for any tool, not just this specifically. But like, don't just be like, that's a new hot thing. Everyone's talking about it. We're switching modes. Like as a design leader, I used to do that with every cool new tool. And my design team got sick and tired of it. They were like, I cannot learn another tool because you're so excited about this. Why are you so excitable? But I'm ops. I'm. I have to be. But but still, the idea is that you have to really consider it, take it into consideration, have a small pilot team, right? Kind of put that instead of. So I saw the the question down here. Are you guys considering that? We're taking a look at it because we want to understand what's out there and just seeing how it could work. Um, is it a replacement? I don't know. Is it an addition to? Perhaps. Um, the same thing kind of still exists though, right? 
you give someone access to a file, all of those things are there. Great that they can now click on an element and get the code for it. But if you're still finding that you're having communication issues, people going into files that they're not supposed to yet just because they have that share link, that is causing more problems than solving. And no new mode of anything necessarily mm -hmm. is going to change that, right? You have to look at kind of what is that underlying issue, right? What is the true root cause that you're coming against? And it's not always the tool that is the problem. Sometimes it really is the ground level process that's the issue. No tool is going to solve that level of an issue. For sure. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Um, let's wrap this up with uh, probably two more questions. Um, one is, I think this was like back to your kind of like org structure and stuff like that from Jennifer. Um, how many designers are on your team? You know, mentioned she's a team of one. Um, so I guess like, you know, you mentioned that you're supporting, I think, was it 13, 13 teams? Um, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, so how many designers are, are doing that support, I guess? Yeah. So I mean, so that is I have to look back at my my thing i i was just telling my boss the other day we were going through something and i was like i always forget how many people we have on our team so we have a total of eight non-leads but the thing is is that our capability lead she is in on project work our design leads are on project work as well so it's not that it's just the ux team and the leads are like sitting back with their feet up our leads are some of the hardest workers that we have on the team um so really when you get down into it the seven eight nine ten eleven twelve you know other than myself like i'm not on project work everyone else is on project work and, and working through that um so it's it's one of the things is that you have those teams but something that our team has figured out and we're actually starting to share this more is creating those cross collaborative and those sub teams right really kind of uh understanding what a project team looks like understanding uh who works well together right who is good at communication who has different skill sets right moving people around where they need to but creating these small sub teams and then being able to understand like how are we communicating that back and sharing that out um you know I am a team of one, right, from a design ops standpoint. But the way I look at it is I also have 12 other people on my team that are my lifelines that I can talk to, that I get feedback from. Um, if you're a single designer and you have a ton of teams you're working with, that, again, you need to start doing some operations, things that people don't like. Time track, uh, you know, block your time, not even block it off, like time block from a productivity standpoint. How long are you spending on which project? How much extra time are you putting in each week? Use that data to create your story because telling someone I'm busy tells most people nothing. Everyone's definition of busy is different. I know some people use like a one through five scale, right? Everyone's worked with the person who's always at a five, but what does that actually mean? So our team implemented that, but I put time to that. So we think about it each week before we go into it. My team takes it very seriously because they know that I'm using that data to kind of set the future stage for what's going on. So you have to use what data you have to create your story, to be able to then say, I'm a designer of one. I'm doing the work of three people. You have to show how you're actually doing the work of three people. It takes time, but you need that, right? To kind of show that you can't just say, I'm busy. Or if you really don't like it, leave <laughs> like if you feel overwhelmed and your leadership is not there to support you leave because honestly they will never do that even if you're showing them that and i don't want you to stress or burn yourself out in a career that you spend a lot of money and time on because you're working for an organization that doesn't respect you yeah you can only you can only fight so much i think before you know it's time to move on yeah i'll finish up with one last question this is kind of a Kind of a hot seat question, I guess. What are the uh, what are the pros and cons of the design ops career ladder? Mm, that's a really good one. Um, the the pro of the career ladder is that there's many types of ladders, <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways that you can go with design operations. So it's kind of a pro and a con at the same time. What I can say, and this will be a little shout out for my design ops assembly uh, community, is that the design ops community is one of the best sharing open communities I have ever been a part of. There is zero gatekeeping that happens in design operations. 100%. Um, so it, it's amazing. It truly is. And so if you're brand new or trying to get started, uh, 
again, I, I'm sure everyone loves me. Everyone in the office is like, yeah, Mar go to the Slack. It's an amazing community. If you have a question, ask it, and you will get more answers than you could ever want in your entire life. It is the most beautiful thing. Um, I talked about that health survey. I learned that from the community. I was like, how can I get extra data? Someone's like, hey, I use this. It's been helpful. And I took it and I altered it for me and made it work. Um, so it's definitely one of those things. I mean, a con is that it's still, it is definitely talked about more, more people have heard about it over these past, you know, few years. So it's a little bit more in everyone's vernacular, but there are still people that don't know what design operations is. So you need your elevator pitch. You need to tell people what you're doing. And the best is you need uh, those people that are there to help support you to also share and talk about what you do. It makes me so happy when my team is like, Mark does operations. This is what he does. This is the benefit that we get. And like, we love it. And I'm just like, oh, y'all love me. Like, this is great. But they know what's happening on the team. If you are there doing something and no one knows what you're doing, then that's not good, right? Like if people can't tell others what you do on your job, that's a bad thing. Um, so just make sure that you are communicating and talking about what's happening there. And then hopefully you'll see that grow. Um, again, I just mentioned it before when the person said, like, how do I build this up? A con is that most people are going to say, well, you have a design operator and it's working out well. What more could you really need? Um, I think, again, you have to continue to show that. So there is a lot of influencing and talking and doing that needs to happen. So a lot of the times you are wearing the, the design ops pants before you officially have the label on the back of those, right? It's just what happens, it's just how it works. And if you're really passionate about it, again, you'll work to make it happen, but you do have to know your limit, right? You don't wanna be, you know, holding that ops flag forever and never moving on because you might be able to find another company who is ready or another team that is ready to bring you on and you have to be willing and open to to take that jump because you're just that passionate about it for sure for sure and like i totally agree with you on using like that design ops assembly support system i mean that community is uh, unlike anything else uh, i've spoken with um adam fry pierce on like a webinar just like this um yeah. hugo welk as well both from the from the design ops assembly and yeah it's it's such a great support system uh you can check those talks out as well in our events page this yeah. one will be there too mark thank you so much for hopping on with me today um you know it, it, we've had many many chats about design ops and design before and i'm glad like everyone else finally got to see it, it was yeah great. and thank you all for your support I, I was so excited when i first saw my very first talk it might have been with adam i was like mm -hmm. oh, damn like like zeppelin is there they're talking about it they're in there they're talking with people about it dave was on here like the fact that i got to talk with you all and share with this community in the same community that those people have like those are people that i continue to look up to every single day so it's been an honor to just talk with you all and share about my experience because you know, I had to work really hard, not that they didn't have to work hard to get here, but like they're sharing like, this is what it could be. And I'm down here sharing like, here's reality a little bit for you if you're just getting started. And I love this space because honestly, it's been really exciting for me to do that. And again, I've had some great support. So um, I, I just offer it out again, if anybody has any questions, reach out to me, especially if you're in that spot. Um, I love to talk about it and strategize and kind of get the good word of design operations out there. Yeah, on that note, thank you again so much, Mark. Uh, I pasted right here in the chat, I pasted a bunch of links. They have Zeppelin links, they have Mark's links to his LinkedIn, as well as his YouTube. Oh um, and then there's also <laughs> a link to the Design Ops Assembly. So in case anybody is curious or does want to join, feel free to follow that link there. I've got my DOA and Zeppelin shirt on here from an event we did in the Bay Area, which was so much fun, uh, but really looking forward to doing some more with both yourself and the rest of the DOA community. So again, so thank you all. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. The presentation and recording will be emailed to everybody as a part of a post uh, webinar sequence. So please feel free to keep an eye out for that. Um, and without further ado, we will go ahead and send you off into the rest of your day. Have a great rest of your week and take care, everybody. See you. Take care. <laughs>